Hello friends, Pastor Charlie here. I'm so glad you clicked on this video. I pray your life will be impacted by this word. Enjoy this service. The truth is we all struggle with control on our daily, weekly, and monthly basis. And our habits tell the story. I want you to think for a moment about the things that you keep trying to control. Some of you didn't raise your hand, but you would if you would have considered what I'm about to share with you. For example, are you trying to control your kids? Like they can't even go outside unless they look like an astronaut. You know, they got helmet, <laughs> hazmat suit, knee pads, a harness, a face mask, you know. Otherwise, they can't go outside. You're trying to control them not getting hurt. Or perhaps you're trying to manage their athletic career. And I know the story, dads, I know the story. You were going to make it to the NBA. You were going to make it to the NFL or the major leagues, but your knee gave out. I know, I know your knee gave out. And that kind of threw your career, uh, threw a wrench in your career. And so now you're trying to redeem your failed dreams through your children and uh, demanding from them what you couldn't achieve yourself. But again, you're not a control freak. You are not a control freak by any, any stretch. Or perhaps you are a spouse. And you think your husband or your wife, they act like a kid and you feel the need to control them. Amen? Or perhaps you're a grandparent and you're trying to control your grown kids because they're not raising your grandkids the right way. I knew y'all weren't going to say amen. Here's one that everybody will relate to. You've ordered a package and you're expecting it in two days, but then you get that notification that it might be delayed. It might be. It just might be delayed. And so there you are tracking it and... And you're refreshing the app like every two minutes as if magically it's going to move your package, you know, every time you refresh it. You're trying to control what is out of your hands. Or perhaps you're trying to stop the aging process and you're buying serums and creams and doing surgery. I'll tell you a funny story. There was a lady, she was only about 50 years old and she went to a church service, got a prophetic word that she was going to live past 100 years old. And she was like, man, I'm only halfway there. So she went that week and uh, she got a full body surgery and makeover since she was only, had only lived half of her promised life. And after a weeks, uh, uh, weeks of recovery, she was finally dri driving home from the hospital. She got in a wreck and died. And uh, this is a story, guys. It's just a, a funny story. Okay? It's not for real. Um, so everybody's like, oh, man. So when she got to heaven... When she got to heaven, she went to God and she said, Lord, you promised, you promised me a life of over 100. And the Lord was like, oh, that was you. I didn't even recognize you. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> now, it's okay to laugh at a funny story, but the reality is that a lot of us are trying to control what is not ours to control. And we often get in trouble for doing so. We're trying to help God or worse, we're trying to be God with certain things. And it's weighing you down. It's causing anxiety. It's, it's pulling you apart. It's tearing you in two. And let me show you a biblical example of control gone bad. Uh, we've all heard of the patriarch of the faith, Abraham. The Lord had promised him, you will be the father of many nations. He established a covenant with Abraham. Here's the problem. When God told Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations, Abraham didn't even have one son. Not even one. And at that point, his wife was 90 years old. But the Bible says in Romans 4 that he trusted the word of the Lord and the, God uh, accredited to him as righteousness. He trusted the Lord. And so he said, hey, if God said it, I believe it. And if I believe it, God will do it. And so he stood on that for a little while. He stood on that promise for a little while. Because guess what happened? Nothing. Month after month, nothing, no pregnancy. And at some point, Genesis 16, verse 1 and 2 says, Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had not been able to bear children for him. This is after God had already given the promise. But she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her, and Abram, watch this, agreed with Sarai's proposal. Of course he agreed. You know the saying, happy wife, happy life, right? 
But here's the deal. God had made a promise. And when God's timing was not consistent with their expectation, they tried to take control of the situation. And their bad decision is still, to this day, negatively affecting the world in a great way. Because Hagar gave birth to a son named Ishmael. Out of Ishmael, you actually have today the Palestinians. You have Muhammad. You have the Muslim faith. And then uh, the promised son ended up being Isaac, by which we get the Jews. And you get Jesus. And here we are centuries later, and you still see war and unrest between Palestinians and Jews. We still have the tension between Christians and Muslims. And so that one little decision to take control into their own hands is still affecting the world in a negative way to this day. Now, chances are your spouse will never make such a request like Sarai did to Abram. But there will be plenty of opportunities in other areas of your life where like Abram and Sarai, you'll try to do what only God can do. And if you do that, you're only going to mess things up. Turn to someone and tell them, don't mess things up. Here's the reality. God didn't give us much control over much of anything. Not the weather. Not our health, not our children, not our marriages. We can't control what other people think or say about us. We can't control if an economic downturn ruins our business. We were not created to be in complete control. That's God's job. Now, he didn't give us control over almost anything, but in almost everything, he gave us what I call agency or will. Agency or will. So for the rest of our time together... I want to help relieve the tension. I want to help you determine when you need to run your race and when you need to endure. I want to help you relieve the tension between when you need to strive and when you simply need to let go. And I want to do this through a series of questions that you need to ask yourself when facing that tension or facing those doubts. Here's question number one. Is it worth my concern? Is it worth my concern? The truth is there are some things that are so trivial and are so small when you consider the big picture and what God is trying to do in your life and through your life that you should not waste much time or effort on trivial things. Look at 2 Timothy 2 verse 4. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life for then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. So watch, Paul is talking to young Timothy with a very clear idea. You're a soldier for Jesus Christ. I'm here to remind you, church, you are our soldiers. You are an army of the living God. And there are simply some things that are not worth too much concern. Let me illustrate this way. I once had a conversation. I had a over dinner with an army uh, war veteran. And uh, I had a lot of questions. I'm just, you know, I'm a perpetual learner. And I, I asked him, hey, I, I want to know what's the, what's the biggest difference between combat life and civilian life? Because he was actually in one of the wars, like fighting, you know, front lines. And I said, what's the biggest difference between your civilian life and your combat life? And, and his answer dumbfounded me. He told me this. He said, you know what, pastor? He says, combat life is actually simpler. And I said, what? You're saying it's easy? No, no. He, I didn't say easy, he said. I said, it's simpler. It's not easier. And so at this point, he had my full attention. I said, please do explain. He said, listen, the mission was very clear. When you're in in danger, when you are in the front lines, when you're in a war, you have no time for worry. There's no room for anxiety. You have three tasks that you have to focus on. Your entire life depends on these three things. What are they? He said, eat, sleep, and survive. That's all we got to do. Eat sleep and survive and we eat what they feed us we sleep where they tell us we wear the uniform and the weapons they give us and then we got to go out there and try to execute the mission without getting killed and that's it that's what combat life boils down to eat sleep and survive and then he added and then i come home 
after the war to realize that my life is a lot more complicated at home. Because when it's time to eat, I'm torn between Denny's or IHOP. When I'm going to get dressed, I'm torn between jeans or shorts. You know, when I'm going to sleep, do I go with the firm pillows or the soft pillows? Um, he says, when morning comes, I'm torn between do I go fishing or do I go golfing? And these are such trivial things, but believe it or not, the fact that I have to choose, the fact that I have to choose, the fact that I have all these options, it makes my life a lot more complicated and a lot more anxious. And you see, when we are running our race as the army of the Lord, we need to, church, also be able to discern when Saint, Satan is using something trivial to rob our peace, when he's using something small to distract us. I've said it before and I'll say it again. When he can't destroy you, he will distract you. And it won't be his fault. That's Satan's job. It's his job to derail you from your purpose and from your lane and from your race. That's his job. But it's our job not to fall for it. So sometimes we simply have to see the bigger picture. Let me help you. Every hour, six to 7,000 people die in this world. And most of them without Jesus. Let that sink in for a moment. Six to 7,000 people, most without Jesus, die in an hour. So if in that hour-long fight with your husband because he bought the wrong, wrong curtains or because he went to the grocery store, you asked for oranges and he brought mandarins. And there you go on a rampage for an hour. In that hour, six to 7,000 people die. Most of them without Jesus. That's 150,000 per day. That means that if your grudge lasts a week, that's over one million people that passed away while you were on your tantrum. My question is, does that put things into perspective? Do we realize that the enemy will sometimes use the most minute things that don't deserve, are not worth our concern to distract us from the mission? The mission of the church is that we would be witnesses of Christ to the ends of the earth, that we would make disciples, that we would preach the gospel, that we would reach out to our friends, our colleagues, our neighbors. But there we are fighting over dumb and trivial things. What I'm trying to say is stay focused. Don't miss your opportunity to be salt and light in the world. You can't control everything, and a lot of things that are stealing your peace simply aren't worth it. I'll tell you at a personal level, level, as a leader, as a pastor of a growing church and organization, I have discovered that I can either have control or I can have growth, but I can't have both. As a husband, I've realized that I can have control or I can have intimacy, but I can't have both. In relationships, you'll find out you can be in control or you can be in community, but you can't be both. If you're always trying to control other people and the situation and your employees and your colleagues and your coworkers, listen, you're going to push them away. You can either be in control or you can be in community. So some things are just not worth our concern. The second question to ask is, is it mine to control? Like some things are worth your concern. Some things are a big deal. But they may, too, they may be too big for you to understand. So the next question, if the answer is yes to the first, is, okay, it might be worth my concern, but, but is this just something above my pay grade? Is it even mine to control? Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this, The Lord our God has secrets known to no one. Some things are just simply out of your league. Stop trying to answer what has no human answer. Stop trying to solve what has no human solution. Now, if there's something that you can do, do it. Because again, faith without works is dead. Faith can move mountains, but if all you've got right now is a shovel, start digging. Are you with me? Jesus promised us a rich and satisfying life. But the abundant life requires responsibility. There's a big difference between surrendering control and relinquishing responsibility. There's a difference. I was here at youth service on uh, Wednesday, and I love what 
I love what uh, Harvey was talking about. He was talking about our responsibility. And I'm going to mention uh, uh, something that he said in, in a bit, but, but I want to tell you that it's not the same to surrender control as to relinquish responsibility. There are situations when you can and you should do your part. For example, if you're looking for a job, what do you got to do? You got to get off YouTube. You got to wake up early. You got to brush your teeth, put on deodorant, go look for a job. If you're single and you're not married, what can you do? Get off YouTube, wake up early, brush your teeth, <laughs> put on deodorant, go look for a husband or a wife. Are you with me? There are some things that we can do. Now, can you open that door? Can you hire yourself? No, you can't. But as you do your part, we believe that God will do his part. I want you to look at a story when Moses was leading God's people out of Egypt and Pharaoh was at their backs and he walked up, you know, the people of God walked up to the Red Sea. God had already told Moses one time, what do you have in your hand? And he kept pointing back to what was in his hand. Look at Exodus 14, 15. The Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Watch, this is important because sometimes we're praying over stuff where we should be acting, where we should be doing. So God is saying, why are you even crying out to me again? Tell the people to get what? Moving. See, sometimes we're moving when we should be praying, but sometimes we're praying when we should be moving. And he said, pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. Now, let's be honest. Could Moses part the Red Sea? No. Could Moses defeat Pharaoh? No. But what was it that Moses could do? He could use what was in his hand and leave the rest to God. He could raise his staff over the waters. And when you release what is in your hand to do, God will release what is in his hand to do. Moses could raise the staff, but only God could part the sea. Are you with me? Here's number three. You got to ask yourself, is it for God alone? We start with, is it worth my concern? Is it mine to control? Is it for God alone? alone. An elderly preacher once told his audience, I want to share my greatest regret with you. And he said this, I wish that I had learned to sail sooner in ministry rather than rowing so hard. I wish that I had learned to sail rather than rowing so hard. And this is a hallmark of control. We often row against the wind rather than surrendering to the wind of God's spirit. Again, as Harvey was speaking this past Wednesday, he said this, don't confuse surrender for defeat. Defeat is when you lose to a lesser power, but surrender is when you submit to a higher power. I love that. <laughs> defeat is when you lose to a lesser power, but surrender is when you submit to a higher power. And I have to remind you, church, you are not in this race alone. You're not doing life alone alone. You are part of a privileged group of people. The Bible says that all things work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to his purpose. He has promised to be with you and never to forsake you. He has promised that not even height or depth, there's no threat, there's no violence, there's no hunger, there's no adversity that can separate you from the love of God. He is with you. He is with you. He is with you. You are never alone. Somebody shout amen for that. So you can submit to a higher power when something is out of your league. Look at Philippians 4 verse 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. I love that. Don't worry about how many things? Nothing. Pray about how many things? Everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Watch this. Tell him what you need and thank him all at the same time. Because you know that by submitting to a higher power, he's got this. He's got this. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Can I give you a piece of advice? Don't ever insult God by saying, well, all we can do is pray now. Don't say it with that tone, please. 
as if prayer is like a last resort. No, prayer is the first line of offense. Are you with me? It's, it's not like, oh, well, the, you know, that's all we can do. No, no, prayer is a powerful thing. You know, when we say all we can do is pray, I can only imagine God up there sarcastically saying, well, all you got, all you got is me now. I mean, too bad for you, right? Uh, you're doomed, no hope. I mean, I am only the giver of life. I am only the creator, the omnipotent one, but all you have is me. No, prayer is never a last resort. Prayer is one of our most powerful weapons. And so Paul is saying, don't worry, pray. Worry is not going to resolve anything for you. Prayer is. In fact, we often worry over things, again, that are not worth our concern. 500 years ago, Michel de Montaigne, a French philosopher, said it this way. My life has been filled with terrible misfortune, most of which never happened. <laughs> How do we translate that to modern Modern times, there, there was a modern study done by Dr. Joseph Gouy, and he concluded that 97% of the things that you worry over are not worth it because 85% of them never happen. And when it does happen, you either deal with it better than expected or you conclude that it taught you a lesson worth learning. And you do the math, and 97% of the things that you worry about don't happen. Some of us even become, become false prophets, right? Like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. You've been saying it for months and you never died. <laughs> right? But a lot of us are anxious and stressed because you're trying to be God instead of leaving it to God. Only God can carry the weight of control. You're trying, but you're folding under the weight. Can you heal cancer? No. Can you heal diabetes? No. You can get treatment, you can get chemo, you can go to great doctors, you can eat right. But only God can heal. Can you control your kid's future? No. You can raise them right. You can teach them, bring them to church, encourage them. But eventually you're going to have to trust God and pray for them. Can you change your spouse? Some of you are like, yeah, that's why I got divorced. I don't mean that. I mean the one you have. I mean the one you... Can you change the one you have? No, you can't. You can help. But listen, you may be a great spouse, but you're a lousy God. You may be a great parent, but you're a lousy God. You may be a great leader, but you're a lousy God. You may even be a great Christian, but you don't make a good God. And there are some things that are for God alone. And so here's the final question that you need to ask yourself. When in doubt, is it a matter of time? Is it a matter of time? Because the issue is not only trusting God's power, it's also trusting God's timing. In my life, I've discovered, I was doing an inventory of my life, and God has answered, I kid you not, every single prayer I have ever prayed. God has answered every single one of my prayers in my lifetime. But here's the deal. Sometimes he answered yes. Sometimes he answered no. And yet other times he answered, wait. There are things that I'm, that I'm living in now that I have been praying for over years. Sometimes God's answer is simply wait. And I know that for controllers, the word wait is offensive. Right? What do you mean wait? But the Bible says, Psalm 46 verse 10, be still and know that I am God. Exodus 14, 14. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Sometimes I see people making the worst mistakes of their lives because they don't wait on God's timing. They might even trust God's power. They just don't trust his timing. You know, I see a young Christian girl and she wants a handsome Christian guy, but since she can't find one, she keeps uploading pics of herself on Instagram and every time showing a little more flesh. By the end, I don't know if she's looking for a boyfriend or a butcher. What are you looking for? <laughs> and it's because you're getting desperate because you're not trusting God's timing. Or there's somebody waiting for a promotion at work, but since it never comes, you start finding faults in your coworkers because you're competing for the same promotion and soon your lack of control starts weighing you down with bitterness and a critical spirit. And you're angry at everybody because things don't go your way. 
or you're wanting to start your own business and you're trusting God and you've been praying and it's a matter of time because God doesn't want to put you in a situation that you're not ready for. Sometimes the dream you're dreaming is too big for your current status and so God's got to build character in you and discipline in you and administrative skills in you. And he's got to see you be faithful in the little things to then place you in the greater things. But you're trying to skip a step or a whole stage. And so you're shooting for something that's out of your reach. And then when it doesn't work out, we're trying to blame God. No, it's that we didn't trust his timing. Are you with me here this morning? Sometimes you just have to stop and tell yourself there has to be a good reason why God is taking his time while I'm in a hurry. Somebody's got to be right, and I have a feeling it's not me. It has to be God. Let me help you with this. Delays in the Bible, especially for Jesus, are less about putting things off and more about waiting for the right moment. We talk a lot about a God that never shows up late, but guess what? He never shows up early either. I can point you to when Jesus received the news of his friend Lazarus. And they told him, Jesus, Lazarus is gravely ill. In other words, he's dying. And the Bible says literally that Jesus delayed on purpose. He delayed on purpose. Like, if that's your best friend, I mean, you're running to his, to his bedside. But no, Jesus delayed on purpose. John 11, verse 4. When Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. Watch this. Why was he waiting? Because... Because the Son of God was going to receive some glory from the delay. Watch this. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. But if you keep reading, verse 14, he tells something to his disciples. It's kind of like a, it's, it's a, it's a tell of what's going to happen. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, verse 14. And for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. For now, you will really believe. Now, watch this. This is about the third year of his ministry. The disciples have been with Jesus for three years. They've seen miracles. They've seen glorious, powerful things. And yet, Jesus says, there's another level of faith that I want to take you to. Now you're really going to believe. Because some of y'all believe, but now you're really going to believe. Come, let's go see him. See, he's assuring them that he has waited in order to increase their faith. He's going to sort of put a seal on their faith so that from this moment forward, their faith will be unwavering. And when he finally arrived, look at Martha. Look at Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, verse 32. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my, bro my brother would not have died this is interesting leave it up there if only you had been here my brother would not have died if you look at that closely mary trusts the power of jesus if you would have been here you with your power would have saved him would have healed him and he would not have died but in the same verse you also see that she doesn't trust the timing of jesus you got here too late. It's too late. There's nothing to be done. The situation is over. Lazarus is dead. But, but you see, why did Jesus wait? He waited because he had something greater in mind than a healing. What is greater than a healing? A resurrection. Jesus, Jesus had healed so many people in his ministry that if he would, have, he would have healed Lazarus, he would have been a testimony among many. But he had only resurrected a few people, maybe two people. And here he is standing before Lazarus' grave with all a, a dominion and authority. And the Bible says that he said, move the stone away. And Mary was still trying to control the situation. And she says, Lord, why are you going to move the stone? He stinks already. You might be in a situation that already stinks and you think time came and went, prayers came and went, God never showed up, and now it's too late. Can I tell you that we serve a God whose power transcends even time? His power transcends the idea of your expectations and your timing for things. 
and he is preparing something on the other side of the deadline, on the other side of the expiration date. You put a limit on God, but God has no limits. And he's trying to take your faith to a greater level because he had healed so many people. But now he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. And what if God is trying to do something greater in your life than even what you have asked him for, even what you've been expecting, even what you have been waiting for? In fact, Lazarus became such a powerful testimony of Christ's power that the very next chapter tells us that when the leading priests finally decided to kill Jesus, guess who they decided to kill too? They decided to kill Lazarus. The Bible says that because of Lazarus, many people had deserted religion and had believed in Jesus. In other words, Lazarus was a walking testimony. When he was raised from the dead, can you imagine running into Lazarus in the town square? Like weeks later, you went to the funeral and you, you about left when it started smelling ugly and you're like, you know, hey, this is day two. I'm, I came, I paid my respects, I'm out. And then Jesus shows, shows up on day number four, raises him from the dead. You don't run into him until weeks later. You look at him, ah, you're scared. And Lazarus is like, why are you scared? Lazarus, I was at your funeral. You were dead. You were decomposing. You left early, didn't you? You, left, you should never leave church early. When Jesus is in the house, you should never leave early, all right? He says, oh, you left early. And, and the Bible says that Lazarus became a witness. Of course he did. How were people that had been to his funeral not going to believe? How were people that had seen the news not going to believe in the power of Jesus Christ? Can I tell you that Jesus in your own life is also attracting people to himself through your life, through what he's trying to do in you. There, there are people in the grandstands of your race. They're watching you. There are people that are going to come to Jesus, not because pastor preached a sermon from the pulpit, but because you led by example from your front yard, from your home, from your workplace. People are watching you. And can I tell you, this is why we need to trust the Lord in all things. Is it worth my concern? Is it for God alone? Is it a matter of time? These are the things that we need to be thinking of. We were not created to carry the full burden of control. Like Lazarus, people want, God wants to use you as a witness and a testimony to others. So I'll remind you of our opening scripture. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of our faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has said before us we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus the champion who initiates and perfects our faith can you stand with me this morning come on give God a shout of praise give God 20 seconds of worship and exaltation God is good and he wants to redeem your situation your circumstance even if it appears dead God is all-powerful. So we're going to open the altars. You've been waiting. Something tells me some of you even stopped praying for that prayer request. You, you even stopped praying about it because the expiration date came and went, and it's, and it's done, or so you think. But God can redeem even the situation that stinks, even the situation that is dead. Nothing is impossible for God. It's time to just surrender control. I'm not admitting defeat. I'm surrendering control to a higher power. And I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust His goodness. Thank you for watching. I hope you can come back and view future services. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our future videos or live streams. Remember to share this video with somebody and don't forget to join us live every Sunday morning. Blessings.